Hello again, everyone. I'm Lauren Deeg, Associate Professor of Urban Planning at Ball State University. Tonight, we're going to be going through a series of ink line sketch exercises, building up from proportional lines, components and details, and then finally ending with tone. So several of these exercises come directly from Paul Lasso's book, Freehand Sketching, and we will be drawing them upside down. So, should be a fun series of exercises. We'll stretch your mind and your abilities, but also help you improve your sketching abilities uh, uh, in, a, in a fast forward manner. Looking forward to it. Should be a fun exercise. Let's get to it. All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Cardinals. Uh, this exercise, this part of uh, uh, our Module experience here in CAP 161 is called Upside Down Cake. Uh, in this series of exercises, we are looking at um, some step-by-step -step examples as given to us from uh, Paul Lasso, Professor Emeritus of, uh, here at CAP, um, retired a few years ago, but wrote several books on sketching, freehand sketching, graphic thinking for designers, and has several books, so I encourage you to check his books out in the library. Uh, as well as on the internet. Um, these series of examples are taken from his book, Freehand Sketching. Uh, it, is, it is still recommended uh, for, for CAP students to take a look at, as it's a very affordable book and one which starts to examine ink line freehand sketching uh, as, as a way of, of learning and enhancing some of your skills. Some of the uh, uh, warm-up exercises or calisthenic exercises that we see here, we can see Paul showing us a series of parallel lines done typical, uh, typically with a, in a comfortable angle or curvilinear lines that support each other. These are great ways to warm up and, uh, and build our visual acuity and uh, our, our motor skills. You can see some cross hatching as well. He starts to do these value scales which help him map out different uh, values that he translates, uh, uh, that he sees from still life and from observation and translates them into build a buildup of Cross hatching, which gives us an, an assumption of value, and other sm uh, smaller calisthenic exercises here, which again uh, build up our visual acuity skills and our motor skills as we continue to connect parts of the brain with the, with the arm, the hand, and down to the pen and to the paper. Uh, so, so these are all good things to be doing during meetings and during classes and Zoom meetings and things like that. In the margins of your notebooks or in your sketchbook, these are always good warm ups. Uh, to do each time you begin to do sketching. Other warm-up exercises that Paul recommended uh, involved by making a pat patterns of dots and then connecting those dots. And what if you start to put some dots in your sketchbook or in your uh, notebook pages, what this starts to do is to help you build a confident line. This avoids what we typically call fuzzy line syndrome or um, I've or, or I speak with students about, um, lines that look like they're searching for a destination. If you start to map out where you want to put the line on the paper, usually with, with two dots, uh, it, you are much more likely to make a confident line that is consistent and that is not searching for a destination. And in that motion, when you start to do that, from a motor skill standpoint, we call this pulling a line. You aren't pushing the pencil, you aren't pushing the pen. You are pulling the pen. You are pulling a line of ink between two between an origin point and a destination point. So there really is a motor skill uh, aspect to to uh, to good line work and good drawing uh, methods that involves uh, understanding the the origin of a line and its destination point. So these are more exercises that Paul would recommend that we do uh, that even got into you know, some, sometimes division of spaces or, or fun little uh, puzzles or games like this that you can do in the margins of your sketchbook or the margins of notebooks and continue to build up your visual acuity. So every time you, you, you pull a line, I recommend create its, create its origin point and then create its destination point and then confidently pull the line between that, that beginning point and that end point. It, you will, it doesn't have to be perfectly straight, but I think you will find that your line work will become much more confident, more consistent, as opposed to fuzzy. So no more fuzzy lines. 
Paul also liked to do lots of still lifes. This is a contour line study of a still life that he built right in his home studio. You can, I think we found Dory here. I think this is uh, maybe maybe something from Finding Nemo, but um, whether it be a shell and, and some uh, brushes and pens. But this is the contour study here. That, so this, this is how, as, far, as far as Paul would take in terms of the contour lines that he was observing with these objects, and even he would start to develop contours around uh, a shade or shadow that you would see on, on the cup, or a shade or a cast shadow from this um, conch shell onto the, onto, the, onto the table surface. Or uh, if, if, if we've got a book or a binder or something like that back here that might have a certain value. So he typically draws the contour line study first, and then he maps out this, he maps out in a little value study here, either on the margin or the edge of his sketchbook, what, how he's going to approach the values. So he does that by, and, and typically by using diagonal lines that are, that are parallel to each other. This is, a, this is the comfortable position that, that his, his uh, right arm works. Paul is right-handed, so he draws like a right-handed person does. Um, and, and a right-handed person might have a comfortable uh, angle such as this, by which one can uh, perform a series of parallel lines closer together to represent different values. And you can see around the fish, he has, a, he has pure black, uh, uh, maybe a, a medium dark to a medium to a lighter value. And as we read this drawing, as we go from the contour to the value drawing, we start to, to recognize and accept that, this, that these areas are in shadow that these areas are in shade and that perhaps even the brush, the paintbrush is casting a shadow onto the book or the paper that's back there. And, and our mind, our, our visual mind starts to accept the gestalt of what they're seeing here. The gestalt is the German word for a psychological or co cognitive conclusion that, that this is a representation of reality. Uh, so we start to accept that this is a fish and this might be a, a, a some blocks, that this might be a a shell or a conch shell or even crumpled paper, that this might be a cup with, with, uh, with pens and pencils and, and a brush. But th that is the cognitive conclusion that what we, we are seeing here is still a drawing, but it is a representation of reality. So just to reinforce that, that, that Paul is doing the contour line drawing first and then he is adding the value. So uh, warm-ups, some of the warm-up studies that Paul would have us do when he, he, was, uh, he was teaching here at the college were a series of squares. And what he would do is have us draw the squares first, and then it would involve mapping out some dots and then pulling lines to close the square. And then he would have us fill each square with a series of these textures. Now these textures may have come from traditional uh, hand drafting. They may have come as depictions of, of materials. They may have come as just um, a cognitive way of, uh, let's see if we can make a series of parallel lines, squiggly lines, or bended lines that, uh, that, help, that can start to occupy the entire square. It teaches us some several motor skills. First, it, it has us start to pull lines to develop the square. And it has us start to use our, our hand and our fingers and our wrist to create re repetitive uh, marks with the pen within a boundary. And so the mind is doing lots of things as it's starting to do these. So this is the first round. This is round number one. If you want to make a screen grab or a screenshot of this uh, for your library, do so now. If not, I will do this as a picture in picture when I begin the exercise. And those will be as reference. The next round of squares looks like this. Again, make a screen grab of this if you like it as reference, but I will do it as a picture-in-picture picture here shortly. Some diagonal points here. And again, these might start to, these, these might be shading exercises. These might be value, uh, uh, ways of depicting value uh, when we're building up tone uh, in a drawing. Uh, these might be material representations. And some of them do come from a tradition of, of hand drafting. Other exercises, little humps or loops. We can see the letter L in here, which could even start to depict uh, uh, a, a tile roof. So this is round number four. And then round number five. Some 
connections to cursive handwriting. I mean, some of the same skills that we use in, in building up tone and texture uh, are some of the same loops and uh, angles and things that we use in cursive handwriting. So if you grew up writing cursive, I know that we stopped teaching cursive in Indiana, but we started teaching it again. Um, uh, some of those same things are involved in terms of how we depict tone and texture uh, as we depict the natural and built environment. So that's round five. I will want to make a screenshot of that, do so now, or I will have it as a picture-in-picture picture when I begin the exercise. Round six is a series of dots and loops. We often use pointillism or loops to represent stone or pea gravel or even concrete. So again, Paul is responding to some of the traditional hand drafting language that we use to depict materials in, in, in the, uh, the art and, and discipline of hand drafting uh, coming forward here into the freehand sketching.
Drawing the environment requires seeing first the elements of line framing. Doing so leads a truer depiction of proportions. Paul taught us to look for the major lines and geometries as we started to build up a drawing. Those major lines or large shapes would create a skeleton on which all other details, components, and tones would hang on. So I call this a skeletal method because looking for the major lines and proportions allows us a much easier uh, sleuthing method in order to locate all of the other uh, details and components and, and, and tones. And so Paul's examples were, were very helpful for us as we began to continue uh, sketching and drawing. Paul's first exercise is called the barn. Uh, it, it is a simple barn, probably in the in the Indiana Indiana landscape, uh, somewhere. Uh, but what I like to do is flip it upside down because uh, Betty Edwards, uh, the educator that I mentioned in one of our earlier talks, uh, often would take subjects and flip them upside down to trick the brain into uh, starting to look for exactly what it was seeing as opposed to what it thought it saw. And so. I take Paul's exercises, I've broken them up here for you, but I have flipped the images upside down as to make your brain work a little bit harder. So that's what we'll see there. Step one uh, looks for the major lines. Step two starts to close some of those gaps. Step three starts to locate the windows and doors and some of the contours on the land. Step four starts to map out some of the harder tones. It would be the black interior of this particular barn. Remember, uh, there's no light emitting from the barn, so, so windows and open doors would appear dark. You can see some shadow cast from the roof onto the face of the barn. And then finally, texture and tone are, are added to this. So, so Paul starts with the major lines. He starts to add the components and then finally we end with the application of tone and texture. Uh, graphic representations of, of uh, the barn siding, the, the metal roof, and the, 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 the grasses and, and shadows that are existing outside of it. So, so we, hopefully we will enjoy really making this drawing together.
Next exercise is a storage barn. This might be very well right here in Muncie, Indiana, for all we know. Uh, but it has some foreground, middle ground, background elements. It has a tree in the foreground. It has a storage barn in the middle ground. It has another, probably a, a hay barn or a larger barn in the background. So this might very well be in one of our Muncie neighborhoods or close to it here in Delaware County. It also has uh, a tree a tree line in the background. So there's one, one two, three, four, five levels of of space here that Paul is using to depict. There's a lot of textures too. There's leaves, there's bark, there's there's um, uh, barn siding and the like. If we flip it upside down, we see that Paul begins with the tree in one of its branches. He begins with uh, the horizontal lines of the barns. That's step one. He then starts to close up the gables and eaves and locate the dormer and the uh, window. He then adds, begins to add some tone, cast shadows from the roof lines onto the sides of the barns. You can see the tree line in the background beginning to take shape as well. And then finally he adds tone uh, and texture depicting the full range of materials and values that we can see there. And so the sketch here ignores the foreground and uses the foreground as a framing element by which he has put emphasis of the sketch into the middle ground, the part that he's interested in. This is a great trick because a lot of artists will use foreground elements to help frame out an illustration or a drawing uh, in order to bring interest into the middle ground.
Unity Temple in Oak Park, Illinois by Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, Paul Lasso wrote a book on, on one of, uh, a wonderful graphic book on Wright's work and so opened up uh, the drawings of Frank Lloyd Wright to a whole generation of folks. Do look for that book on the library. Um, Unity Temple is, is uh, considered one of Wright's modern masterworks. It's one of the most interesting uh, places of worship I've ever been to uh, and, and was way ahead of its time. So what do we do is, again, I flip the image over. Paul begins by creating the bounding box around the entire photograph. This is probably a four by six photograph that he took many years ago. He then locates the major lines uh, uh, that bound out the box of the sanctuary itself as well as some of the angles. We talked about measuring an angle by closing our eyes and holding the pencil and, and trying to match the angle and then bringing it down to the paper. There are some subtle angles here that are worth measuring with your eye. If you close one eye, hold up your pencil and try to match the angle and then take it down to your paper. Also notice the relationship of lines to the frame. So this diagonal line is, move, is pointing to roughly to the middle part of this left-hand side of the frame. We, we can see that this angle here is roughly in the lower third. We can see that this, this line here is roughly in the right quarter. If we were to, um, this is where the halfway point, this would be the quarter point. So starting to see where major lines occur relative to the frame is a great way to begin to build your, your acuity of composition and framing and proportions. Where is a major line relative to the frame uh, that we're actually making the drawing? So it's, it's always helpful to have a framing device with us when we're in the field. And if, of, course, of course, if we take photographs in the field and we draw them later, uh, the, the pictures are already framed. But then we can start to see how Paul is attaching more of the components and details, the lintels, uh, and, and the um, jutting roof line, the cantilevered roof. He's also indicated here, you can't see it upside down very well, but he's using uh, uh, hands of the clock to re represent how steep an angle is. Sometimes uh, we use that relative to uh, a watch. Uh, of course, nobody wears watches anymore, so um, uh, your Apple Watch might be able to do that. But, uh, uh, but these angles might have a certain time signature attached to them. Step three, Paul begins to, to add in some of the textures of the landscaping in the foreground as well as the window frames and the additional lintels and starts to map out where the shadows are occurring. That would, this is the equivalent of a contour line drawing at this particular point in step three. And then finally, Paul adds values. So he has dark values, medium values, and light values to give our viewer the depiction of light shade and shadow in this depiction of Unity Temple by Frank Lloyd Wright.